Hello, I'm Dr. Sean Hawkey and I lecture in politics in the Institute of Irish Studies at the University of Liverpool and I've been asked to give a brief talk on the functionality of the Northern Ireland Assembly, i.e. how well has the Assembly been doing its job. Um, I think this video will be useful to A-level politics students who are looking at political systems in the UK um, and for those students in Northern Ireland who are taking the CCEA A-level, I think this touches upon one of the, the units in your first year. So that's what this talk is going to be about for the next, I think, maybe 15 minutes. Um, we're going to look at, firstly, what we expect of a legislature. And secondly, how well has the Assembly been performing the functions um, that are expected of it? Most of you watching this video will be aware of the fact that the institutions in Northern Ireland have only recently been restored. They collapsed in January 2017 and we had about a three year period of no um, devolved government in Northern Ireland. But even before that drama, I think it's fair to say that there was frequent and um, quite searing criticism of Stormont and of the Northern Ireland Assembly. People saying that it was a mockery of democracy, that it isn't working, that it was a waste of money, all it did was cause problems and so on. So what I like to consider in this um, talk is to what extent is this criticism justified? Is it true that the Assembly is you know, a waste of space and good for nothing, or has it been performing some functions reasonably well? To do that, to, to kind of judge the Assembly, I think firstly we need to establish what are legislatures for? What is the job of a parliament? And if you're watching this video in a classroom, now might be a time to pause the video. Um, to ask this question amongst yourself, what is the purpose of a legislature? I think it needs to be said um, there is no universally agreed number as to the number of responsibilities um, that legislatures have, the number of functions that we, that we expect of them. At the very least there's three, um, but I'd like to discuss four functions because I think the fourth one is important. Um, there are plenty of political scientists out there that will say there's many more than four functions that a legislature is responsible for, but at the very least I think we can say three to four. The first of which is to make policy. So the, the clues in the name, legislature legislation. So the job, and it would be considered the kind of primary job of a legislature, is to assent to legislation, to pass bills that create or amend the rules that we live by in society. The second is to provide a forum um, to represent people's views in. So we elect MLAs because we agree with their policy positions. They share similar views to us um, and they go to the legislature and they give voice to those views and opinions. The third is scrutiny. So that is to monitor and be prepared to challenge the decisions, policies and expenditure of the government. And the fourth one um, is linkage. So MLA, this is usually carried out through the work of individual MLAs. MLAs have a responsibility or a job to link citizens to the government. So they will take information from the government. So for example, what a policy means or how to complete paperwork to apply for a government program. And they will explain that to their constituents in their local areas. And they will also listen to the concerns, um, the complaints, the questions of their constituents and take some of those concerns back to government, to politicians, to, to ministers, to civil servants um, and relay those concerns. So I think we can say there are at least four functions that we can expect of a legislature. And the, the next question that, that I would um, ask is, well, how well has the Assembly um, done with respect to these functions? In terms of policy making or assenting to legislation, I think you could get the impression, particularly if you're reading some of the media accounts of the Assembly, um, that it doesn't 
achieve much by means of legislation because there is gridlock or you hear about stalemate and impasse. Um, but when it comes to legislative productivity or the number of bills that the Assembly is passing, the Assembly's record actually compares quite favourably with devolved legislatures in the UK. So that, that data in the top right hand corner that um, notes the number of bills passed uh, in each mandate in Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland. And they're, they're good comparisons um, to make. Um, we have some unique circumstances, of course, because we are a power sharing legislature, um, but we're a devolved legislature and we are responsible. The Assembly has similar responsibilities and policy competences um, to, to Scotland and to Wales. And for example, you can see in the most recently completed full mandate, so that mandate lasted without any disruption or suspension 2011 to 2016, the Assembly passed 67 bills, so that's more than double that of the Welsh Assembly, um, and not too far behind the Scottish Parliament. The Assembly has also improved its performance in passing non-executive legislation. Now, what does that mean, non-executive legislation? Well, there are at least two types of bills. Executive legislation, that is introduced by ministers in the government, and non-executive legislation that is introduced by the Parliament. And there are two ways um, for um, non-executive legislation to be introduced in Northern Ireland. Um, MLAs, individual MLAs, can introduce a private member's bill, or the committees, parliamentary committees, can introduce a committee bill. Now, the, in the, the early years of, of devolution, it has to be said that members and committees seemed a bit reluctant to dip their toe into non-executive legislation, um, especially the, the committees. Um, some bills were introduced as private members' bills, some passed, but, but certainly not a lot. Um, but the, the most recently completed mandate, 2011 to 2016, that term saw more committee and private members' bills introduced and passed since the institutions um, were established with the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. And some of those private members bills were actually pretty significant pieces of legislation. And such was the surge, such was the increase um, in private members bill proposals um, that the, the infrastructure that the, the um, assembly couldn't cope um, with the number of uh, members who were coming forward with these new ideas for, for private members bills. Um, so the Assembly essentially became a victim of its own success. Um, now that shouldn't have happened, the, the suspending of the private members' bills function, um, but it, it's not the staff in the Assembly who are at, at fault there. Um, but it is to be welcomed that it seems to be the case that our MLAs and our committees are becoming more confident, more prepared um, to come forward with what they think are good ideas, good policy proposals, things that they want to be enacted into legislation. So I think the overall point here to make is that when it comes to legislative productivity, the Assembly has not underperformed. Now you could say, you know, it's a question of quality over quantity and you just can't count the number of bills and say, you know, the Assembly has done an excellent job. Um, but I think when you look at the comparative context, um, we can say that the Assembly has not underperformed in its policy making role. Moving on then to scrutiny, how well has the Assembly uh, performed its role as a scrutineer of government? I think the first point that needs to be made is that, you know, we are a power sharing system. We are a consociational system of government and consociationalism is a particular type of a power sharing um, democracy. And with a power sharing democracy, the emphasis firstly is on creating an inclusive government. So trying to get as many people, as many parties and as many perspectives into the government as possible. Now there are reasons for that, reasons to do with the Northern Ireland conflict, reasons to do with us being a divided society. But one of the disadvantages of that system is that if lots of parties are in the government, there are, there are fewer parties outside of government to form the opposition. And usually the job of scrutiny falls to the opposition. So, for example, um, in the current assembly, there are 90 MLAs and the overwhelming majority of those MLAs are MLAs in governing parties. 
Only seven MLAs um, sit outside the, the Northern Ireland Executive, um, and that is unusual, at least by um, UK and Irish standards. You would expect a much larger um, opposition uh, because it's serious work and it requires a lot of time. Um, but in Northern Ireland, we, we don't have that. There is provision to create an official opposition. There are parties in the executive who could leave the executive if they wanted to form an opposition. Um, but at the moment, they have decided not to do that. So that means that there are very few MLAs outside the executive who are looking at the executive um, and being pre and are fully prepared to challenge it um, without worrying about what the consequences would be for the government's reputation. Um, and so on. Now, it does have to be said that as it happens, the MLAs who sit outside of government, I think they also are the most accomplished parliamentarians we have, and they, they do um, make the best of a, of a um, less than perfect situation by asking the difficult questions, challenging the executive, tabling parliamentary questions, and so on. There have been um, some high profile scandals that some of you will be aware of. Um, probably the best known is the Renewable Heating Incentive Scandal, which collapsed the institutions in 2017. And those scandals, they would suggest that the Assembly needs to do better in terms of achieving rigorous scrutiny. And I, I would agree with that. But what I would also say about the RHI scandal is that I think it also revealed that elements or components of the assembly um, really did rise to the challenge as the crisis unfolded. So the, the, the weeks prior to the, the full collapse of the institutions, for example, the Public Accounts Committee, um, which was headed by uh, Robin Swan at the time, that really did do a good job in uncovering some very uncomfortable facts um, and in challenging um, and criticizing um, some of the people and personnel who were involved in the, the running of the RHI scandal. So while, yes, that scandal does raise serious, did raise serious questions about the Assembly's scrutiny role, as it developed, I think aspects of the Assembly really did rise to the challenge, especially the Public Accounts Committee. There is an accusation, as I said a, a moment ago, because we have a maximally inclusive government, we have executives of four, sometimes five parties. We've got five parties in the executive at the minute. And sometimes there is a bit of an accusation that amongst those parties, there is a kind of you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours mentality where they, they don't really challenge one another. Um, like this article in the BBC compared them to um, Goodfellas, the five families of Stormont. As it happens, I think that's a little bit unfair. Um, MLAs, even MLAs that belong to parties of government, um, they do ask some pretty awkward questions of one another and they do challenge one another. And I think a good um, evidence base for that is if you look at written parliamentary questions, so you can go on the Northern Ireland Assembly's website um, and look at the questions, for example, that DUP MLAs ask of Sinn Féin ministers and Sinn Féin, minister, minister, or Sinn Féin MLAs ask of DUP ministers and there is, I think, a healthy volume of questions that are being asked by MLAs of governing parties, of ministers, their own ministers, but of ministers that belong to other parties as well. So I think there is some scrutiny taking place within the executive, even if, if that isn't very well publicised, but there is a record of it. And you can go and look at those written parliamentary questions yourselves. For sure, there is still plenty of room for improvement uh, because I think the executive has a poor record for responding to written questions on time. Usually, um, an executive has to answer a written question within 10 days, um, but often that isn't the case. And the, the executive needs to do something um, to improve that because written parliamentary questions, especially for members outside of MLAs outside of the executive, you know, the Clare Sugdens, the Jim Allisters, um, People Before Profit, the Green Party and so on. Um, that is an important mechanism for them to hold the executive um, to account. And as I mentioned before, parties do have the option of forming an official opposition. Thanks to John McAllister, he introduced a private members bill that created official space for an opposition. 
resources, additional finances for the op for an opposition. Um, but parties in the executive have decided that they would rather be in the executive um, than outside of it. And that might be another moment for you to pause this video and to consider why that is the case. Um, why, for example, have the SDLP and the Ulster Unionist Party changed their minds um, after the 2016 election? Those two parties decided that they wanted to be in the opposition and they formed the first official opposition in Stormont. Um, but most recently, when the executive reformed this year, at the beginning of this year, they decided that they didn't want the opposition and they wanted to join the government. Um, and that, that's an open question. I'm not going to provide, provide the answer, but that might be something um, for you to discuss amongst yourselves. Um, and if you are supporters of those parties, would you prefer them to be in the executive or would you prefer them to be outside of the executive in the opposition, scrutinizing the executive? Thirdly, and I talked about this um, function um, with uh, in terms of it being constituency service, um, the linkage function, the job that MLAs do linking citizens to government, helping citizens with their, their problems and concerns, and also explaining government to citizens. So you might have a constituent coming to their MLA and saying, you know, I have to fill out this form for this application. I have to fill out this form for... Um, some kind of government program, I haven't got a Mary Lou. How do I do this? And the MLA will help. Um, so you'll see um, probably in your local area a bunch of these offices dotted around. Um, these are MLA's constituency offices and Friday is the constituency day for MLA's. They will hold a surgery where constituents can come and speak to them in person to ask them questions or to complain to say, you know, you know, this minister did X or said Y and I'm very angry about this and I would like you to tell them. So the MLA is kind of a conduit, a, a channel of communication that explains government to the people and then takes the, the people's questions and concerns back to government. Now, it has to be said that MLAs need to strike a balance between their constituency work and their parliamentary work, i.e the work that they're doing in their local areas and the work that they're doing in the assembly, holding the executive to account, tabling parliamentary questions, speaking in debates and so on. And some of our MLAs are too constituency focused. Sometimes you'll hear in Northern Ireland um, the expression parish punk politics when it seems that MLAs are too focused on the local concerns and aren't focused enough on the, the big picture, the work that the Assembly is doing, debates, legislation and so on. Um, that is true for some MLAs, but if we are going to be fair and, and, and look at the evidence, it has to be said that, that overall MLAs devote roughly the same amount of time to constituency service as MSPs in Scotland and AMs in Wales. So roughly, this is research that I did um, on MLAs a few years ago, Roughly, you know, 28 hours per week they'll devote to constituency services, which is roughly the same what happens in, in Scotland and, and in Wales. Finally then, um, and we'll, we'll end by looking at this function, representation. So there's kind of no hard metric or evidence to measure representation or um, to compare representation. The, the kind of overall question I would ask with respect to this function is, is the Assembly a fair representation of Northern Ireland society. In one sense, we could say yes, because the electoral, the electoral system that we use, PRSTV, achieves very good vote to seat proportionality. What do I mean by that? Um, so for example, in 2017, the DUP captured 28% of the vote, and therefore in the assembly, they got 31% of the seats. Now, if that was perfect proportionality, it would be 28% of the vote, and 28% of the seats. Um, but no electoral system delivers perfect proportionality. Um, but ours is actually quite good. Um, Sinn Féin, for example, in the last election, they won 28% of the vote, and that transferred into about 30% of the seats. Other electoral systems, so for national elections to Westminster, first past the post, that can be um, very disproportionate. 
Um, and you can have some parties that are overrepresented in terms of the seats that they win and other parties very underrepresented. Um, so in, in our case, because we use PRSTV, um, we do get good proportionality. Um, we can say that the, the expression and the views of voters are fairly reflected in the composition of the assembly and the number of seats the parties have. In another sense, though, um, we could say, no, yes, the assembly reflects the views of those who actually vote in elections, but wider societal opinion seems at odds with the composition of the assembly. What do I mean by that? Well, look at the composition of the current assembly. Overwhelmingly, um, the seats are um, occupied by nationalism and unionism. As you probably know, whenever you, if you're an MLA and you're elected to the Northern Ireland Assembly, one of the first things that you have to do is designate, i.e. you have to sign a register that says, I'm a nationalist or I'm a unionist. And if you don't want to do that, you can be an other, what's called an other. Um, so the others would be, for example, the Green Party, the Alliance Party. Um, but overwhelmingly, election after election after election, um, the seats, the great majority of seats are occupied by nationalists and unionists. At the moment, um, only about 10 or 11% of seats in the assembly um, are occupied by the others. Now, to outside observers, and I teach um, Northern Ireland politics here in England, and when people look at this data, sometimes they get the impression that that is how the wider population of Northern Ireland think in terms of their politics, i.e. there's very, very few people in the region who identify as neither nationalist nor unionist. But that really isn't the truth. Um, around 40%, anything up to 50% of the Northern Ireland population do not identify as nationalist or unionist. Two years ago, the Northern Ireland Life and Time survey found that 50%, so half of the people in Northern Ireland, did not subscribe to the kind of orange and green politics. That has fallen, but it is still significant. A significant chunk of citizens in Northern Ireland, around 40%, don't identify as nationalist or unionist. But it also happens that these people are less likely to vote. If you are another, if you are not nationalist or unionist, you're least likely to vote in Northern Ireland elections. So another um, opportunity for discussion is this an issue? Is this a problem? That there seems to be a, mi a mismatch between the composition of the Northern Ireland Assembly and the wider Northern Ireland population. Why aren't that section of our community voting? Um, would you vote if the opportunity was available to you? Soon you will be of voting age um, if you're um, in, in secondary school or in college, for most of you anyway, you will be, soon you will be of voting age. Will you vote? Why or why not? Is there things that the assembly needs to do or the executive needs to do to encourage people um, to vote? And again, that, that is an open question, but it's certainly a relevant question and a live question, um, particularly if you're, if you're living in Northern Ireland, that is. Um, and I will, um, I will leave that for you um, to discuss amongst yourselves. Perhaps you think it's not an issue and it's only fair that the Assembly reflects those people who make the effort to vote. Okay, so in terms of a um, summary to this, this talk, um, I think that the overall point I've, I've tried to make is that yes, we have an imperfect system to be sure, but the Assembly has shown itself um, or shown that it can perform some functions reasonably well. It's worth emphasizing the point that even when people were really annoyed with the devolved institutions, when they collapsed, when they disappeared, you know, 27, 2018, 2019, the uh, public opinion polls that were being conducted by people like John Tong, Pete Sherlow, showed that consistently people wanted a return to devolution. When people were asked, do you want joint authority? Do you want direct rule from London? What do you want? The majority of people in Northern Ireland, even though they were annoyed with the devolved institutions, they wanted them back. So it is the preferred op option in terms of governance of the Northern Ireland population. 
some old problems remain and we have some seen we have seen some disunity in the executive during the handling of this pandemic for example new problems for sure will likely emerge um, but the system has also shown itself to be reformable in january 2020 when the institutions were re-established um, parties signed up to the new decade new approach agreement um, and this is something that you if you're interested in reading more about um, the assembly the executive and institutional reform um, this is an activity that you might want to to take forward um, in this new decade new approach agreement the parties um, all of the major parties signed up to i think pretty significant reforms and um, there's a short article i've provided the details for here only six pages and that kind of summarizes the package of reforms that were agreed at the beginning of this year um, so you might want to look at that um, article ask yourself you know what problems have been identified in that agreement and what solutions have been agreed by the parties um, as they move forward okay well i will leave uh, it there and um, i hope that you find that useful um, my contact details are at the bottom hand left corner of um, this slide my name is dr sean hockey i'm at the institute of Irish studies at the university of liverpool um, and it was very good um, to talk to you thank you